Hey guys, Dozer here bringing you a new video. This video is going to be talking about sideboarding for Prism. I know that a lot of you guys have been asking for a more in-depth Prism sideboarding guide. So I thought I would talk you guys through the sideboarding options that I tend to gravitate towards to give you guys a bit better of an idea as to why I run them, which matchups to run them in, and kind of how to play those matchups to get the most out of them. Uh, for more information, please check my individual matchup guides. Um, I'm still putting those out, but I have started that series, so please go to the um, uh, Piloting Prism series uh, on my channel. It's a playlist that I'll link in the description, and you can see those videos as they become available. So let's get started. So the first thing I want to talk about is equipment. So Prism has a couple key equipments that she is most known for using in every matchup. Um, those equipments are going to be things like her um, Halo of Illumination, they're gonna be things like her Phantasmal Footsteps, they're gonna be like Vestige of Soul and Luminaris. These currently are Prism's best options for her equipment, and so a lot of the time they are going to be exactly what she is looking to use, and um, we don't need to worry about siding those out. So normally we're not gonna have to worry about siding out any chests, heads, or leg equipment, as well as we're not having to side out any weapons. However, we do have the hand slot in order to slot different things in and out. So the first thing we're going to be talking about here is going to be the good old fashioned Dreamweavers. So Dreamweavers is one of Prism's default options. It's really useful because it allows Prism to simultaneously push through a pivotal phantasm attack on a key turn, as well as allowing her to um, use the spell void sometimes to help mitigate some arcane damage if that should ever come up. But normally this is going to be useful in matchups like Guardian um, or uh, Brute or things where you normally won't be able to resolve your Heralds otherwise. They don't do arcane damage to you and so having this as an option just to make sure that you can get a tempo turn through is going to be really, really powerful, especially once you've worn down their armor throughout the game and can hit a Dreamweaver to Erudition or if you can Dreamweaver's a big Phantasm like a uh, Phantasmoclasm to really force your opponent to block and give you the tempo. Um, in addition to that, we run uh, Goliath Gauntlet. Goliath Gauntlet is for the other half of the coin on those matchups where we are allowed to attack with our Phantasms. And so Goliath Gauntlet buffs our attacks by two, um, our Heralds that is, because they all cost two or greater except for Wartoon. And when we use Goliath Gauntlet, we're basically telling our opponent, hey, um, I'm going to come in with a big attack this turn, and you're going to take this extra damage, and we normally save that for Herald of Erudition. So a lot of times that's going to be useful in the um, Ninja, Ranger, Mechanologist type matchups where, um, although Dreamweavers versus Mechanologist might be better in some cases, where you are trying your best to hit that big Erudition turn by getting past their Blade Break equipment. Um, or get through their armor. So against Warrior, you might use Goliath Gauntlet as well, just to try and force them to use some of their armor, or once they've gotten through some of their armor, then you can actually hit them with your Erudition. So uh, that's Goliath Gauntlet and Dreamweavers. However, the third equipment that I'm normally a big fan of using is the Null Rune Glove. Null Rune Glove especially comes in against Arcane Dealing classes. In fact, that's the only time we run it, because obviously it helps us reduce the Arcane damage that's coming in for the measly cost of giving up either Goliath Gauntlet or Dreamweavers, depending on the matchup. And when we're being defensive, Null Rune is especially useful, especially when we're playing against Kano, Chain, and Briar to some extent, Viserai. Um, these are basically the only arcane dealing classes, except for Prism herself, which we run Null Rune gloves in the mirror. Um, so we run this in the Prism mirror because we want to use it to stop personal retribution pings to preserve our own shields. It gives us a lot of control in that matchup much more than Goliath or Dreamweavers would. Um, in addition to that, against Viserai, Chain, and Briar, they have a lot of magic damage coming in from Rune Chants and other incidental instances. So having the ability to pitch to use our footsteps as well as give that outlet with Null Rune to help reduce some damage is normally very efficient for us um, by giving up that one-time use ability on the Goliath or the Dreamweavers. And then for Kano, obviously, it's our one way to really reduce his damage in combination with the Spell Void on Halo and the Merciful or the uh, Spectral Shield reducing arcane damage. So that is going to be our equipment lineup. 
And so now we can start talking a bit about the actual cards that Prism doesn't run in every matchup. Um, but first, let's start off with the ones that Prism runs in every matchup, in my opinion. So we'll start off with Energy Potion. So Energy Potion is always useful for Prism. She has so much go again with Luminaris that at the end of our turn, we can always drop an Energy Potion and feel good about getting it into play. It pays for our hero ability. It pays for soul shields. It pays for um, heralds and footsteps. It pays for basically everything. So Energy Potion is a great option for us to run. And I run two copies in every single matchup for a reason. Um, we do not sideboard this card ever. It is always in. Another card that is always in at the max copies that we run is going to be Herald of Protection Yellow and Herald of Protection Blue. In addition to that, we run every Blue Herald except for Tenacity at three copies. Um, we run Herald of Erudition and Wartoon Herald. We always run these cards. We run three of, of all these Heralds because they form the foundation of Pitch in our deck as well as Block, Synergy with Genesis, and our amazing attacks, especially for their cost. Doing five damage go again for two resource is amazing as a blue. And if our opponent pops it, we didn't really invest that much into it because normally we're using those resources to pay for our bigger cards like our auras and um, or our Tome of Divinities. So a lot of the time these cards are used for block and then sometimes they're used to attack. And when they are, they're very uh, impactful, especially when they come in at the end of an attack chain after you've already attacked with all your auras and such. So I always run these cards. There's never a time that I take these out. They are in every matchup. So moving on from those Heralds, uh, we can start talking a bit about a couple other cards that I run in every matchup. Um, those cards are basically always going to be Tome of Divinity, Soul Shield, Sink Below Yellow, and Sink Below Red. The only exception to this is when you're playing against Kano. Obviously, you're not going to be using your defense reactions, but um, you'll run basically anything you can for pitch at that point or a big scary attack. So the reason I run these in every single matchup is that Tome of Divinity with our Vestige, Halo, Soul Shield, and all the blues and stuff that we run combined with our auras allows us to generate card advantage, have a late game plan, as well as have a tempo plan, and is just an overall fantastic card. Uh, Soul Shield is one of the best cards Prism has access to. It's an amazing card and the light talent. Um, a six block for two that helps us get the instants out of our hands that are yellows is amazing. It turns on our vestige. It puts stuff into our soul. It does everything that we want it to do. Soul Shield's amazing and you're never sad to see uh, Soul Shield unless you're playing against Kano. And even then it's not that bad because it's a light card that's yellow pitch. So it works with like Halo turns and stuff like that. Um, Sync Below, Yellow and Red, on the other hand, can be seen as a bit more niche but I'm a very big proponent of using them in every build of Prism in every um, list because it helps you fix your hand and Prism having such specific matchups and specific situations where different cards are useful in different matchups, being able to dig for them and get rid of things that you don't need is so pivotally important to Prism that I run them in basically every matchup. Again, the only time I'll ever try and take them out is against Kano and even then I'll try and leave the yellows in if I can in order to have that pitch. Um, so yeah, I run those in every matchup. Beyond that, though, we have a couple cards that can differ depending on the matchup. So something like Whispers of the Oracle is going to be pretty situational because a lot of the time, Whispers of the Oracle, yellow specifically, um, is really only good in the long matchups. Um, or in defensive matchups. So it blocks three and is a yellow pitch. So it kind of does everything you want as a one card left in your hand type of deal. The only issue with Whisper of the Oracle is that um, it, it doesn't synergize with your Genesis and it's not a Herald. So you might think to yourself, oh, I'd rather run a Herald that's yellow and blocks three and everything. And you can do that. But what I mainly run this for is Bolton because being a non-attack action that blocks for three, it's very good at slowing Bolton's momentum down and um, forcing him to waste resources, as well as being a great card in control matchups like Oldheim, Dash, um, and even Bravo to some extent. Being able to know what you're going to get, uh, sculpt the top of your deck to try and hit more big tome turns is incredibly powerful, especially like if you have this in Arsenal because you didn't need it on one turn, and then you have an Erudition, and you're like, okay, I'm going to Goliath Gauntlet Erudition, 
But before I do that, I'm going to make sure the next two cards are usable for me. That's so powerful. Um, so I run Whisper of the Oracle in basically every matchup, but it does more work in slower matchups um, or in hyper aggro matchups where you just need as much block as possible and to fix your hands preemptively. So I'm big on that card for that reason. Uh, the next couple cards that I want to talk about are going to be some instants. So Prismatic Shield Red is a card that I run in almost every matchup that I can. Um, it is normally the last card that I cut if I'm trying to get down to 60 because it fuels so many of our other effects that Prismatic Shield does a ton of work for us in like every matchup. Um, the only matchup I would say to not run Prismatic Shield in, red specifically, would be something like um, a hyper aggro matchup like Briar or Chain or something because basically you would rather be running the yellow Prismatic Shield instead um, for the pitch if you had to get down to 60 because like if you're early on in the game and you have some extra pitch, you can get rid of it to get some healing down and get some damage in. Um, but otherwise, the um, the red one is going to give you a lot of value. The thing is, is that red and yellows together do a ton of work against the matchups where they're strong. So for instance, Bravo, I run all six Prismatic Shields, three red, three yellow. Against Orinthia, three red, three yellow. I run um, basically in, in every matchup that's not ice, or um or hyper aggro i run both at six um like you know combined but against ice i will tend to run um just the reds because i know that i'm just going to be playing them i need as much of them as possible and um, i'm happy to get rid of the yellow in the ice matchups because the one extra pitch isn't really gonna make that big of a difference and um especially against oldheim the red prismatic does a lot of work uh, it, but you don't really need more than the reds against Oldheim. Um, so moving on. Um, also versus Prism, I should note, um, running all six Prismatic Shields is really important um, because that matchup is decided based on who has the most uh, Prismatic Shield tokens, Spectral Shields. So moving on from that, um, there is one Spectra that I tend to not run in every matchup. Um, that's going to be Ode to Wrath. So Ode to Wrath, I think, is the most um, sideboard-specific aura. Genesis is always going to give you value. Merciful is always going to give you value. ALS is always going to give you value. Um, but Ode to Wrath, against certain decks where you aren't able to set up your uh, extra resources or against decks that have a lot of ways to mitigate your on-hit effects is going to make Ode Wrath a lot weaker, and you're going to want to run other cards instead. So mainly I'm thinking of Oldheim. Oldheim with Ode Wrath is very difficult to justify running Ode Wrath for, um, unless you're going to run like one copy or something. Um, I try to take out as many as possible, um, and I prioritize it very uh, on a low level there. Um, I tend to take out Ode Wrath versus Prism because against Footsteps and Spectral Shields, you're really not going to be able to... Um, to them, and so Odorath is going to be a big resource sink that's not going to give you a lot of payoff, um, and if they break it like a token or something, you're feeling really bad. Um, additionally, it's a snowballing card, so if you know that you're going to be on the back foot the entire game, like against Hyper Aggro, Chain, or Briar, or something like that, uh, Odorath is really not going to do any value for you unless your game plan is specifically to try and eat all the damage you can, try and get your auras down, and then crack back at them. If you're trying to do the blocking strategy, Odorath is not what you want to have with that. Um, against Bravo, obviously Odorath comes in. Um, against, you know, Kano, Dorinthia, every character that your auras are good against, Odorath is good against. But um, there becomes this dichotomy of this breakdown where you've got hyper aggro, you've got normal matchups, and then you've got, hey, my auras are free matchups, right? So... In the hyper aggro matchups, you're going to try and prioritize cards that block, um, as well as trying to prioritize cards that keep your life total high and have very low um, synergy requirements. So they have high floors, even if they have lower ceilings than other cards, versus in absolute blowout matchups, like where your auras are amazing, like against Kano, Dorinthia, um, things like that. You can afford to run basically every single aura, uh, even like Bravo to some degree. Um, but then you have a lot of other matchups like Katsu, Prism. Um, Reinar, uh, even Levia to an extent, Dash, 
you can't afford to run as many Spectras because they have ways to counter them or punish you for playing them. So generally, I would say Odorath would come out in a lot of those matchups, depending on um, how favored you feel in that matchup based on your local meta and based on your experience in the matchup. Um, so that's what I would say about Odorath. Definitely one of the most cuttable instants in the deck. Um, another very situational card is going to be Glisten. So I love Glisten. I mean, we can see it right here on the mat here. Um, it's always been one of my favorite cards, but the thing about Glisten is that it has the matchups that it's good in, and it has the matchups that it's bad in. Glisten is amazing in any matchup where you are consistently able to protect your Prismatic Shield tokens and get value off of them. Um, and if you can't do that, or if you don't have the freedom to ever get Spectral Shields down, Glisten will never get you value, even though it's effectively a cheaper copy of Ode to Wrath. If you think about it, Ode to Wrath equals the same amount of value as Gliss, like a yellow Glisten, once it hits three Spectral Shields, versus Glisten gives you that value off of one. So if you are consistently able to go hyper wide and have extra resources, you know, your Ode to Wrath will cost you two cards to play. You know, let's just say it costs you, um, you know, two yellows to play versus one yellow to play. If you're able to snowball and you're able to go hyper wide, Odorath is definitely going to give you more value. The thing is, is that Glisten operates on a much smaller economy. And so against matchups like Oldheim, Bravo, and um, even stuff like Katsu and Dash, where you can't always keep your Glisten token up, but there's a certain part in the game where you can use it to pressure. Um, Glisten's very good. Especially Yellow Glisten. Like, there's a couple ways to use Glisten that I don't think people have had enough practice to really understand. So I'll go over that now. Um, <clears throat> Glisten is mainly powerful for two reasons. One, it's an attack reaction that can be played at instant speed, and it gives your stuff go again, and it gives your stuff extra attack. So by putting three Glisten counters onto a Spectral Shield, we're able to not only attack with Spectral Shield for one, pump it by three and connect for four if our opponent doesn't have a defense reaction, but because we're pitching a yellow in that moment to activate the Glisten, um, we're actually giving all of our Spectral Shields go again um, once that yellow hits the pitch. So before the attack finishes resolving, we can give go again to everything in a kind of a sneaky way off of a single yellow, especially if that Glisten was in our arsenal. Um, that's one of the best plays you can do, actually, where you have Glisten in arsenal, a single yellow in hand, and then you have like some shields out. Like, maybe it's only like three shields, um, or even two, and you're saying, all right, I'm going to attack you for one. Like, let's say you don't have any soul. They're saying, okay, sure, no blocks. You say, okay, activate Glisten, pitch a yellow, and now you're able to come in for not only one damage, but you're able to come in for six damage. A big difference. Um, that is very nice in matchups where you can protect your shields, especially when you have multiple shields, because you get to control and choose which shields are destroyed when you take damage. So if I have three Glisten tokens on a shield, and I've got two other shields, and my opponent attacks me, and I would take one or two damage, I could choose to destroy these Spectral Shields and not take the damage onto this one, keep this one with the tokens. The important thing about that is that the more tokens you're able to have in a matchup and insulate your shields against future attacks, the better Glisten becomes because now you have all this extra block that you have to work with, which is effectively armor that you're creating. And then Glisten can do a lot of work in that matchup. Whereas like if you're not able to make that many tokens in the matchup um, and you're struggling to keep them alive like against Briar or something, Glisten really doesn't get you any value. Compare that to a matchup like Katsu, where he can threaten your Spectral Shields pretty easily with Kadachi Kadachi, right? However, we have access to our Phantasmal Footsteps and Spectral Shields. So if we pitch, say, a blue card, while we have cards in Soul, we'd be able to create a Spectral Shield token and block with Footsteps for one on that turn. And as long as he doesn't Razor our card, we can block both Kadachis before losing our Spectral Shield and potentially blocking his other stuff with cards from hand. The thing is, is that this is where the late game Glisten comes into play. Late game Glisten is just referring to the fact that in the early game, when you're attacking with Heralds, you can pitch Glisten, 
for the end game. And once you enter the end game and you've got a bunch of yellows in your hand and you may not have that many heralds left, you can say, oh, okay, like I've got some yellows and a glisten. Let me prism ability and then glisten the token up and start attacking. If your opponent is down to say, you know, 10 or so life, and you're coming at them for four go again um, and are able to protect that spectral shield, you can eventually get them into a type of Kadachi lock where you attack them for lethal with a buffed up spectral shield and they're having to worry how many glistens did that person fetch? Do they have another glisten? Can I afford not to block this attack? And that's where you start winning games with glisten because basically you tell your opponent, all right, I run glisten. I've pitched them all game to the bottom. Now we're in the late game. I'm drawing effectively razor reflexes off the top of my deck that I can stack and have permanent value. So if I'm attacking for four and I've got, you know, three cards in hand, because I already had a glisten token, let's say I protected it, um, and they had a weak turn, then I can say, okay, well, hey, Katsu, um, you're at seven life right now. How much do you want to bet that I don't have another glisten? Right? If they don't block this, they go down to three. If they do block it, I can pump it up with Glisten anyway. And, you know, that would pump up this to seven total attack. And then, boom, if they failed to, to block that, now they're down to, like, three HP. You can easily start Spectral Shield Kadachi locking them with just new Spectral Shields that you make, say, off of a Prismatic Shield or off of a Merciful Retribution. But then you also have the ability to swing with your Spectral Shield potentially on the next turn and lock them out of the game because now they're having to block every turn. They can't block enough in order to stop the damage while also fighting back. And then that's when you grind them out of the game with Glisten in the end game. So late game Glisten is amazing in mid range and control matchups. It's also just really great in slower matchups in general. The only time you're not really gonna get value out of Glisten is in aggro matchups because obviously aggro matchups blocking is really important and throwing out attacks is really important. So the late game value plan isn't going to work as well. Um, so that's Glisten. Moving on from Glisten, we have a couple more cards that I want to talk about. So a card that I never run because I've tried it. I don't like it. It's not good enough. Parable of Humility. So I run zero of this card. I don't care if it's against a Brute. I don't care if it's against an aggro deck. Paying four resources is not good enough for Parable. The reason is, is because if I have to pay for two cards plus a parable to activate this card. I'm giving up three cards to create a spectra that reduces everything by one. If my opponent is coming at me with one, two, three, four attacks on their turn, let's say it's Briar or something, and I have a parable up, it's gonna reduce each one by one. That's four value of block effectively um however we could have blocked nine with three cards if they had blocked right if we weren't running instant and we were running let's say some heralds and let's say that parable was any other card like another herald we could have blocked for nine hp for the same amount of cards as parable and stopped more damage Especially if, on that last attack, they come in and destroy the Parable immediately. So, we stop three damage from that, and whatever was on this attack. Let's say it's Rosetta Thorn. Let's say it stops four damage. So, we stop seven damage um, with this Parable, compared to the nine damage we could have stopped with our, with our Heralds. Not a good trade. Um, if you're able to get Parable in for two cards, right, with a blue plus Vestige then yeah, it becomes a lot easier to get the value because now you're sacrificing six block of potential block and all you have to do on average is stop two attacks before they break the parable with another attack and then you would have gotten slightly more block than you would have otherwise. However, parable is not an aggressive card. It's not proactive. And against the decks that you're able to keep your spectres alive versus, they don't really care about parable. Um, Dorinthia, Kano, Bravo, Old Time. These, these decks don't really benefit very much from, uh, or like you don't benefit in those matchups by having Parable out. 
either it doesn't affect their attacks, like it doesn't work on weapons, so it doesn't really do anything to Dorinthia or um, <clears throat> Bravo or Oldheim. And it also doesn't, you know, do anything to Kano um, at all, right? It doesn't give you any extra value versus him. And yeah, it's an aura and he can't really remove it, but you're only getting a Kodachi every turn. That's not, that's not really good value for four resources when Kano can probably nuke your face if you try to play that. So I would say Parable is something you should consider to never run just because of how situational it can give you value or how situational it is that it gives you value and um, how expensive it is to play and resolve. So Parable, I think, is 100% not viable to run in Prism at this time. Um, the next things that I wanted to talk about were going to be um, the attack action cards that come in and out depending on the matchup. So what are those? Those are going to be Phantasmoclasm, and um, we'll start with that. So Phantasmoclasm is a great sideboarding card because it allows us to do very well in the matchups that we are allowed to attack with Heralds into such as Warrior, Wizard, Ranger, Mechanologist, um, even Runeblade. Like, it can be a really versatile card. The only deck that you really don't want to run Phantasmoclasm into is Bravo, because, or like Levia, because you'll never actually get to resolve the attack, um, and you need better access to pitch. Uh, against Oldheim, you actually do like running Phantasmoclasm because you need block that doesn't cost resources to play. Um, so having Phantasmoclasm is actually very good into Oldheim. Um, and obviously it's just a nine attack card that messes with our opponent's hand, which will normally get rid of whatever Phantasm Breaker is in there. So it's kind of like a souped up uh, Herald of Triumph. Um, that's also got a lot of other utility as well. So I would say Phantasmoclasm goes in in every matchup, except for Bravo and Levia. Um, and even against Levia, you can run it. It's, it still blocks. It's still a good attack when you have Dreamweavers. So it's never bad. It's just... Um, you can probably find something better in those matchups. But I run Phantasmoclasm in almost every matchup, so keep that in mind. Um, now we're going to get into the true sideboardy type options. We already talked about um, Glisten, which is very sideboard focused. Odorath, which is very sideboard focused. The Prismatic Shields, which are very sideboard focused. And even Whispers of the Oracle. Everything else has been pretty much run it in every matchup, except maybe Phantasmoclasm, which is kind of in that middle tier where we've got our auto includes, we've got our uh, probably includes like these, and then we've got our sometimes includes. And then now we're going to finish it off with a couple more niche cards. So first one is going to be Celestial Cataclysm. Celestial Cataclysm is a fantastic card for Prism. It is a light card that blocks for three, and it has seven attacks. So naturally, we run this card as an anti-Prism tech, we also run it in any matchup that we're trying to block a lot. So that's against heavy aggro as well as against Oldheim because, again, it blocks three and doesn't cost us anything to block with, unlike defense reactions. So against ice, Celestial Cataclysm is very good. Um, and it's normally a very good card to run. It's, it's very hard to cut this card a lot because if you were doing well and you have a lot of cards in your soul, it's an absolute blowout. If you have, If you're behind, it still blocks and it synergizes with everything that we're doing. So Cataclysm is an awesome card, and it's a really good like workhorse for the deck that has a lot of flexibility. So I would highly recommend running Cataclysm in most matchups. Um, however, against someone like Kano, against someone like, um, uh, you know. Yeah, against someone like Kano, or into certain matchups where you have more aggressive stuff that you need, um, Celestial Cataclysm can come out, but it's definitely not the first thing that I'm going to cut in most matchups. Um, it does come in that kind of... Uh, I mean, we'll put it over with Phantasmoclasm. It's something that we run a lot of the time just because of the natural synergy. However, comparing that, we have Raging Onslaught. So this is a red Raging Onslaught. It uh, pitches for three, attacks for seven, blocks for three, and pitches for one. It has no effect. The reason we run this card is that it's an anti-prism card through and through. It is our anti-phantasm card. It breaks every phantasm in the game if you draw it. If you aren't playing against Prism, it still blocks three. And if you're playing against a deck like Guardian or something where you're struggling with your phantasm breaks, it's still a seven attack card that you can pay for with one card. So 
it's very efficient to just pitch a blue and swing with Raging Onslaught on a turn where you're trying to be defensive um, if you have to, where you can also block with it. The only downside is that it does not synergize with your Genesis and Halo type effects, so, and it can mess up your pitch consistency. So I tend to only run it versus Prism, Oldheim, against Aggro, and then sometimes I'm going to run it uh, into Bravo, though I have not been doing that recently. Um, so I'd put it in the sometimes you run it category. Uh, then we're going to have Unmovable. Unmovable is like super god tier card because, and then this is yellow, because obviously it pitches for our go again uh, in block six, which is perfectly fine. Um, Unmovable, being able to block as much as it does with one card combined with Soul Shield especially, lets us just completely wall tall decks. Bravo, um, even Dorinthia by being able to play it from Arsenal. Unmovable is so incredible versus those decks. And even against like aggro decks, it's pretty good at uh, just turning, upping your average block value in your hand um, by trying to get as many instants out of there as possible. Like against Chain, I ran Unmovable. I'm back at the Calling Las Vegas, and it did very well for me there. Against Levia, against Reinar, it feels kind of bad sometimes because he might intimidate your blue out of your hand, but it's still a good card to kind of deny his, um, his effects. Though, cheaper defense reacts tend to work better against him anyway. Um, but yeah, Unmovable is fantastic. It single-handedly, like, carries the Bravo matchup and the Dorinthia matchup. Uh, so, definitely put it in for those. Though, I wouldn't run it versus most other decks. Um, I don't run it versus Ice, for instance. I don't run it versus Kano, unless I need Pitch. And beyond that, you know, you don't run it versus Ninja or most Runeblade decks. Though if you see Earthfire becoming more popular, Unmovable is very good at blocking tall decks, so definitely consider running it there. But yeah, so that's Unmovable. I would say it comes in in very specific matchups, but when it comes in, it's incredibly impactful. And I would say that's the same for every card in the rarely used category. These cards have to be absolute bombs in the matchups they're put in to be worth including because of how infrequently they're used. Um, or the meta has to demand that whatever answer they're brought in for is very popular. So, like, if Bravo is extremely popular, you run Unmovable, or like Dorinthia. If Prism is super popular, you run Raging Onslaught Red. If you see a ton of Dash and a ton of Oldheim, Glisten in more quantity is going to be the way you want to go. Um, if, um, and this is kind of the same thing, like Bravo, you'd have, like, Ode, uh, Prismatic Shield, you'd have against, like, Ode and Prism, um, like, you'd have against, like, Bravo and Prism, and against a lot of matchups, honestly, it's just that against aggro, you really can't afford to run that card, so I would take it out for that, but you could leave these other cards in versus aggro. And then I have one more card that's kind of a dishonorable mention that I want to talk about, and that's going to be Chains of Eminence. Chains of Eminence as a sideboard card is really terrible because it doesn't do anything, it only lasts one turn, and it's not very flexible. Even with the innate synergy of having Phantasmoclasm with Chains of Eminence, or being able to lock down a piece of equipment to try and get through with an attack. It's just so finicky and so low value that I like running it. I think it's a really cool artwork and a really cool idea of a card. But really, unless Chains of Eminence said, when it enters the arena, name a card, then the card can't be pitched, played, or used to defend while Chains of Eminence is in the arena, your opponent may discard a card with the called name if they do destroy chains of eminence if that's what it said then chains would be amazing um but it doesn't say that so it's not amazing and at least in the current metagame it just does not have enough impact to be worth running in prism where every card counts if it blocked three that'd be a different story but it doesn't so um i would say never include chains of eminence in a list i don't think it's really worth running just kind of like parable um and that about does it um if you want to take a look at my sideboarding list that I use for Nats, I'm going to link that in the description. You can feel free to look at what ratios of stuff I ran. Um, in most cases, I ran every copy of a card if I could into certain matchups, even if it brought me over 60. So um, the only caveat to that is going to be Glisten. So Glisten is the only card I run different ratios of, depending on the matchup. So I run two copies of Yellow Glisten, 
if I'm up against normally Bravo or decks that I think I can reliably get it off. Um, if I'm playing against a deck that I'm only going to use in the late game, I run one Glisten. That's going to be stuff like Katsu and Dorinthia. You know, decks that have these attack reactions, but having the one Glisten as an option in the deck is very strong, especially when it's the yellow. So normally perfectly happy to run one in that case. And then I run four Glisten. So it's either one, two, or four. Uh, I run four Glisten. That's three yellows and one red against Oldheim because he's such a... And, and Dash as well because there's such slow matchups that you really want to see glisten as often as possible and that even if they break the token with all the counters you can just rebuild it again with the other glistens so glisten is the only um card that would really change the uh the ratios for otherwise it's either run every region onslaught or don't run it at all run every immovable or don't run it at all run every yellow prismatic or don't run it at all etc cataclysm phantasmoclasm ode to wrath whispers red prismatic and then, of course, we always run um, every Herald and all of that. So, um, a couple cards that I also don't recommend running, um, and you guys know this because I've said this a million times, but uh, I really hate the card uh, Grand Library of Solana. I think it's a really huge trap a lot of the time. Uh, and we can look at my little proxy version here um, while we're talking about it. Um, I've tested it a ton. It doesn't help us in the matchups we already win enough to warrant running it like we already kind of auto win a lot of matchups if we play right so we don't need the one of library to try and make that game plan happen especially when we draw it at the wrong time it doesn't pitch it doesn't block it messes up our hands half the time i'm putting it with my halo into my soul to draw a different card um and it's kind of incredible how often that happens but if we were able to run three library then that'd be a completely different story I mean, if we had the consistency of being able to open with this, then we would be able to kind of make up that opportunity cost, especially if you could imagine having three of these bad boys out. Oh my goodness, could you imagine drawing seven cards at the end of your turn? Holy crap. Yeah, no. Uh, so if we had three libraries, it would make more sense to run it, or even two, but having it as a one of just makes it kind of like a luck-based card. And even when you get it, it doesn't always just win you the game, which it kind of should for how big of an opportunity cost it is based on how it doesn't pitch and block. So um, I don't like a uh, great library. I wouldn't recommend running it, um, especially if you don't already own one. I would never pick one up uh, to try and run it because your deck doesn't need it to be competitive. Um, the only other card that really kind of should be talked about here briefly is Arclight Sentinel. Um, Arclight Sentinel, I run at max copies in every matchup. Um, the only thing is is that um, sometimes you need to up your block. And while this has a pseudo type of block value to it, um, if your list is able to run more three blockers, I would probably cut Arclight Sentinel um, for more three blockers and aggro matchups. But Arclight Sentinel is obviously very good versus tall decks. Um, and even against wide decks that do some setup, like maybe Dorinthia, and it, it does work versus Katsu. It can do work in any matchup. It's just kind of clunky to use sometimes. So that about does it for the video there. Um, thanks for watching. Always appreciate you guys taking the time to come by and visit the channel. I really appreciate you guys as kind of the community of Flesh and Blood that we've got. So yeah, just thank you again for uh, making my time on YouTube a lot of fun. So in the meantime, I've got some other stuff in the pipeline here. So look forward to some exciting announcements in the future. And stay cool, guys. I'll catch you later. Peace. Hey guys, Dozer here. Thanks for watching. I wanted to give a shout out to all the patrons to thank them for supporting the channel. Uh, first off, Dreamweavers, Terra Blitz, you rock. Thank you for being a Dreamweaver patron. For Sentinels, Alex, David Ramish, Tim J, Michael Lynch, and Joe Gianoli, you guys rock. Thanks for being Sentinel tier patrons. And uh, for the Heralds, I want to give a thank you to Ike Vikagan, Tommy Heikinemi, Carl Letman, Jake Arms, Jacob Wilson, and Francesco Lorenzi. You guys are awesome. Thanks for supporting the channel. Uh, for anybody else that wants to support the channel, uh, feel free to check out my page on Patreon to look at all the different tiers and see what they give. Thanks for watching again, and take care.